at the chart on our back wall if you didn't bring your chart with you. Notice that in between the seven vials of God's wrath and the return of Jesus Christ is what scholars refer to as an interlude. Now, in literature, an interlude is what we would call parenthetical information. In other words, the chronological flow of events is interrupted in order to give the reader some valuable information. Information that they need to know or they're going to get lost. This particular interlude includes two chapters, chapter 17 and 18. Chapter 17 deals with the destruction of the whore of Babylon. Chapter 18 deals with the destruction of the city of Babylon. Now listen to me because this is very important. The whore of Babylon and the city of Babylon are two different things. Do not confuse the two. Now some of you might be wondering, why in the world are you really emphasizing this? Well, the reason I'm emphasizing this is because the majority of scholars confuse the two. And they'll tell you chapter 17 and 18 are the two most difficult chapters in the Bible. And they're really not if you don't confuse the two. All right? I know they're not the same because the whore of Babylon is destroyed sometime around the middle of the tribulation. Right around the time of the abomination of desolation. And the reason that she's destroyed is because the beast and the ten kings hate her. On the other hand, the city of Babylon is not destroyed until the very end of the tribulation. It's destroyed by the earthquake of the seventh vial and by fire. And when it's destroyed, the kings lament over her. So, who is the whore of Babylon? Well, let's look at what we know about her. We studied this last week. We know that the whore is a city. Verse 18 tells us that. She sits on seven hills. Her name is Mystery Babylon, which is code for Rome. She controls the life and the lifestyles of people from almost every nation. She's incredibly wealthy, and she became drunk on the blood of the saints. So who is the whore of Babylon? Well, when you look at all the facts, there's only one person or one thing that it can be. It's the Vatican City, the Roman Catholic Church. Now listen to me. I am not saying that Catholics are not going to be raptured. There's going to be a lot of Catholics that are going to be raptured. And I'm not saying that the Roman Catholic Church is staying here and the Protestant Church is going to be raptured. No, 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 no. The Bible does not make a distinction between the... Or the Bible, I'm sorry. God does not make a distinction between Roman Catholics and Protestants. Not at all. The distinction that God makes is between saved and unsaved. There's going to be a lot of Protestant people that are not going to be taken in the rapture. So I want you to understand that I am not coming in and picking on Roman Catholics. But when you look at all the facts, there's only one person or one thing that could be the whore of Babylon. And that's the Vatican City, the Roman Catholic Church. Now, why is she called a whore? Well, she's a whore because over the last 1,400 years, she has prostituted her values and her beliefs to gain political power and wealth. In fact, I almost brought a book out. It's really interesting reading, but it kind of gives you a history of the church. And let me just say this. The church as a whole does not have a good history. And I'm not just picking on the Catholic church because when the Protestant church came out of the Catholic church, if you read our history, we don't have a good history either. Most of the time, Christians have not acted like Christians. But the reason that God refers to her as the whore of Babylon is because she has prostituted her values and her beliefs. She's also referred to as the mother of harlots because she's enticed others to prostitute their values and their beliefs in order to please her. Now, in verse number 3, we are told that the woman is sitting on the beast. Look at verse number 3. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. So the woman, who's also known as the whore of Babylon, is sitting on the beast. Now that's very important because the position of sitting represents control. No, none of us are going to actually get on a horse unless you're a cowboy and you rodeo that has not been broken. Because we understand that when we get up on the horse, we're supposed to be in control. And if the horse is not broken, we're not going to be in control. But you need to understand that sitting represents control. So what this is saying is that the whore is controlling the beast. So according to verse 3, the whore of Babylon will control the beast in the beginning. In fact, it's the whore who brings the beast to power. But at the midpoint of the tribulation, he will no longer need him. Or need her. And because of that, he's going to turn on her and destroy her. Now, who or what is the beast that she's sitting on? Well, that's what we're going to cover tonight. 
the mystery of the beast. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. It's going to seem like a lot of time because I'm going to go all the way to 8 o'clock. But the truth of the matter is I spent already about three weeks on this subject and had to break it up into three weeks. Now, the reason I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this is because we've already covered the majority of this material when we were in chapter 13. We did that because the beast is introduced in chapter 13. So what we did was we jumped ahead and we studied, cha studied chapter 17 right along with chapter 13. We kind of combined the two chapters together. And since we've already covered this material, all I'm going to do is kind of skim over the highlights of it. All right? So let me begin with a personal observation. To me, understanding the mystery of the beast is kind of like solving a riddle. In fact, it even sounds like a riddle. Just listen and see if it sounds like a riddle to you. John saw a beast rising out of the sea. The beast had seven heads and ten horns. And on each horn was a crown. And on the heads were blasphemous names. The beast resembled a leopard, but it had feet like a bear and a mouth like a lion. One of the heads on the beast had been mortally wounded, but it was healed. And all the world was amazed. It was given a mouth, and the mouth spoke blasphemy. And power was given unto it for 42 months, three and a half years. The beast was and is not, and will come up out of the abyss. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. There are also seven kingdoms. Five of the kingdoms have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. The beast that was and is not is the eighth kingdom, but it's also one of the seven kingdoms. What is the beast? Now, you have to admit, that sounds a lot like a riddle. and almost is something you would find in an Indiana Jones movie, right? You know, we get to this point, and we read about this, and we have to know what the mystery of the beast is to be able to go on. But let's be honest. The majority of people hate riddles. And the reason they hate riddles is because they think that they can't understand them. And if you can't understand them or you can't solve the riddle, you don't like them. But the truth is, you can't understand the mystery of the beast. God did not mean for this to be a riddle. Yes, it is a mystery. But he has given us every clue that we need to be able to understand the mystery of the beast. Through the help of the Holy Spirit, God has just opened this book up and you're able to look at all of the things that it says about the mystery of the beast, and it's, and it's not really that difficult to understand. And the reason I say that is because I've studied it for a long time. Does that make sense? But here's the interesting thing. You can only understand the mystery of the beast if you've studied the book of Daniel. Because the book of Daniel is the key to unlocking the mystery of the beast. That's why so many people cannot understand the book of Revelation because they don't understand that the key is found in the book of Daniel. The key to unlocking the mysteries is in Daniel. You see, Daniel explains the symbolism. From the book of Daniel, we know that the heads on the beast represent kingdoms. So the seven heads on the beast represent seven kingdoms. Now, these kingdoms don't just represent any or all kingdoms. They only represent the world empires that have persecuted Israel as a nation. So let me give you a list of all the world empires that have persecuted the nation of Israel. Here they are. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. That is six kingdoms. The seventh kingdom is still to come. So six of the heads represent past kingdoms, and the seventh head represents a future kingdom. Now, let me show you how I know that. Turn to Revelation chapter 17. We're going to look at verses 9 and 10. It says, This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is the other has not yet come. Now, I'm not going to explain verse number 9 at this time, but I am going to come back to it. In fact, I'm going to explain exactly what that means. But for now, I just want you to look at verse number 10, and then we'll wait till the very end of the sermon for me to explain verse 9. Notice what it says. It says, the seven heads are also seven kings. The word kings is translated from the Greek word basilus, which can refer to kings or kingdoms. Now, in this case, it means kingdoms. So the seven heads are seven kingdoms. Well, Pastor Allen, we already know that, right? Right. Then John tells us this. Five have fallen. One is. The other has not yet come. 
The five that had, that had fallen were Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, and Greece. And then he says, and one is. The one that was ruling, ruling during the time that John wrote the book of Revelation is the kingdom that he's referring to. When he says one is, what does he mean by is? He means is in existence. That would be the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was ruling during the time that John wrote the book of Revelation. And then John says, the other or the seventh is yet to come. In other words, it is a future kingdom. One that will come into existence in the last days. So the seventh head on the beast represents a future kingdom. A future world empire. And this future kingdom is going to possess the best characteristics of all of the previous kingdoms. It's like it went out there and it shows the best from the Egyptian, the best from the Assyrian, the best from the Persian, the best from the Grecian. And it took all of these characteristics and it wrote it into one super world empire. Look back at chapter 13, verse number 2. The beast I saw resembled a leopard but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne in great authority. Now, the Grecian Empire was like a leopard. So in the book of Daniel, he likened the Grecian Empire to a leopard. So we know the representation. We know the symbolism because we study the book of Daniel. The Grecian Empire was like a leopard because it was quick and it was agile. It wasn't slow and cumbersome. And the reason that it was able to conquer the world is because it could actually get to the battlefield before anyone could prepare. Literally. They moved so fast, and the world had never seen an army like that before, so they were able to conquer the world. The Persian Empire was like a bear. It was strong, and it was powerful, and it feared nothing. And it just poured so many people at you, kind of like what the Japanese did in World War II when they would just charge, and they would have these just uh, mass people just running towards the lines. And that was how the Medes and the Persians were. They were like a bear. The Babylonian Empire was like a lion. It was ferocious, but most of all, it was majestic. It was probably the most majestic kingdom that ever was up until that time. Now, we've had a few since then, but it was a very majestic one. So what this is telling us is that the beast is going to be a combination of all of the best characteristics of the previous kingdoms. So in essence, the seventh and the final kingdom will be the most powerful and the most wicked kingdom that's ever existed. We know it's going to be the most wicked because Satan is the one who gives it its power and its authority. Look at the last part of verse 2. We read this. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. Now we found out in chapter 12 that the dragon is who? Satan. So of course Satan is the one who gives it its authority, its power. And so as a result of that, it's going to be the most wicked kingdom there's ever been. Now verse 3 in chapter 13 tells us that one of the heads received a fatal wound. Look at verse 3. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Now, if you read, read the uh, Left Behind series or if you've watched any movies that deal with this, they always show the Antichrist being assassinated in some way. He receives his head wound and he comes back to life. But actually, that's not what this is talking about. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a history lesson so you can understand what this is talking about. Every one of the previous kingdoms that we've talked about were conquered. But once they were conquered, they were absorbed into the kingdom that conquered it with one exception. That exception was the Roman Empire. So even though every one of the first five kingdoms eventually fell, they still continued on by being absorbed into the next kingdom, the kingdom that had conquered them. The only exception was the Roman Empire. It fell but it was not absorbed into another world empire. So basically, the Roman Empire died. And that's the fatal wound that John is talking about. But one day, the Roman Empire will be revived in the last days. In other words, this fatal wound is going to be healed. That's why we refer to the beast as the revived Roman Empire. Now, turn to, to verse number 5 in chapter 13. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. The mouth is referring to a spokesperson, a leader. Now, this is very important because from this time on, the beast in John's vision can refer to one of two things. 
It can refer to the seventh and final kingdom, which is the revived Roman Empire, or it can refer to the Antichrist, the leader of the revived Roman Empire, because he is the mouth of the beast. He's the spokesperson. He's the one who rules the beast. Now, it's very important that you understand this. So I want to say it again in just a different way. The beast in John's vision represents the Antichrist, but it also represents his kingdom. So sometimes the word beast is used to refer to the Antichrist as a person, and sometimes it's used to refer to his kingdom. Now, let me explain why that is. During the middle of the tribulation, the Antichrist is going to be given so much authority that he won't just be the leader of the revived Roman Empire, he will be the revived Roman Empire. It's going to be at his beck and command. He will be the absolute ruler of that empire. He will be a dictator. Does that make sense? Now, it's very important that you understand that because if you don't, you're going to get confused when we get to chapter 17, which is going to be in just a minute. So does everyone understand that the beast can refer to the Antichrist or can refer to his kingdom depending upon the context? Everyone got that? Good. Turn to verse number 8 in chapter 17. Now we're going to go through chapter 17. The beast which you saw once was, now is not. And will come up out of the abyss and go to his destruction. The inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast. Because he once was, now is not, and yet will come. Now again, this kind of sounds like a riddle, but it's not. It says that the beast once was. Now is not, it will come up out of the abyss. Now, in this passage of scripture, the beast does not refer to the revived Roman Empire. It's referring to the ruler of the revived Roman Empire, the Antichrist. So according to John, the Antichrist was once on the earth, but now is not on the earth. And yet, he will come to the earth in the future. Now, a lot of early church fathers thought that this was talking about Nero. They thought that Nero was the Antichrist. And they thought that one day Nero was going to be reincarnated in the last days. Now, there's some other theories on this. Arthur Pink and several other scholars believe that this is talking about Judas Iscariot. They believe that Judas Iscariot is going to be reincarnated one day. And that Judas Iscariot is the Antichrist. But you need to understand something. The Bible does not teach reincarnation. So this is not talking about a person being reincarnated. This is talking about the spirit of the Antichrist. And I can prove that to you. All right? Let me show you how the Bible sees this. Malachi chapter 4, verse number 5 says, Behold, I am going to send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now, because of this scripture... The Jews believed that Elijah would come back to the earth right before the Messiah came. So when Jesus came on the scene, where was Elijah? I thought he was supposed to come back. If Jesus is the Messiah, show me Elijah. Well, turn to Matthew chapter 11, verse 13 and 14, and let me show you Elijah. It says, For before John came, all the prophets and the law of Moses looked forward to this present time. Now Jesus is talking. He says, Before John? All of the, of the uh, prophets and the law of Moses look forward to this time. And if you are willing to accept what I say, he is Elijah. Who is Elijah? He's saying John is Elijah. The one the prophets said would come. Jesus said John the Baptist was Elijah. Now, was Jesus saying that John the Baptist was Elijah reincarnated? No. The Bible does not teach reincarnation. Let's look at another scripture. Look at Matthew chapter 17, verses 10 through 12. Then the disciples asked him, Why do the teachers of religious law insist that Elijah must return before the Messiah comes? Well, we know why. Because they study the Bible, and Malachi 4, 5 said that. Jesus replied, Elijah is indeed coming first to get everything ready for the Messiah. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, but he wasn't recognized. And they chose to abuse him, and in the same way, they will also make the Son of Man suffer. Now, notice what he's saying. Elijah did come, and they didn't receive him. Who was Elijah? 
John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist was not Elijah reincarnated, but he had the spirit of Elijah. In other words, he had the very same zeal and the same vision as Elijah. Not only that, he had the very same purpose to turn people to God. So when it came to Elijah, Elijah was once on the earth, then he was not on the earth. But right before the Messiah came, John the Baptist, a, a person who had the spirit of Elijah, did come. John the Baptist had the spirit of Elijah. He was not the reincarnation of Elijah. But he came with the same zeal, the same vision, and the same purpose. And that's what Revelation chapter 17, verse number 18 is talking about. There was a person who once lived on the earth that had the very same zeal, the very same vision, the very same passion as the Antichrist will have. And no, it was not Hitler. Hitler was kind of like that, but there was a person who did the very same things that the Antichrist will do when he comes. His name was Antiochus Epiphanes. In fact, he was a type of the Antichrist, and we shouldn't say was, he is a type of the Antichrist. And he did exactly what the Antichrist will do, except on a smaller scale. Antiochus actually gave himself the name Epiphanes because he, caught, he saw himself as the manifestation of the god Zeus. So he entered the temple of the Jews in Jerusalem claiming to be God and demanding to be worshipped. He actually set up an altar to Zeus, to Zeus which he claimed to be on top of the altar in the Jewish temple. And then he had a pig sacrificed on it. He also set up a permanent idol of Zeus in the temple. So this was a foreshadow of the abomination of desolation. He also outlawed all of the Jewish customs and he replaced all of them with worship of himself. He outlawed the observance of the Sabbath, circumcision, and the Jewish feast. Which was the equivalent of changing the times and the laws in which David talked about in chapter 7 verse, not David, Daniel talked about in chapter 7 verse 25. And last but not least, he burned all of the scriptures. These are all of the things that the Antichrist will do. So what John is telling us in Revelation chapter 17 is that the same demonic spirit that possessed Antiochus Epiphanes is going to possess the Antichrist. And he will do exactly what Antiochus Epiphanes did except on a greater scale. That's why he's coming up out of the abyss. The abyss is the holding place of demonic spirits. So when he says... He was and is not, and he comes up out of the abyss. He's talking about the demonic spirit that will possess the Antichrist. Now look at verse number 11 in chapter 17. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Now believe it or not, this is really easy to understand. The seventh and final kingdom, which is the revived Roman Empire, is going to be made up of a coalition of ten kings. If you remember on the beast or the seventh head, there were ten horns. Does that make sense? Those horns represent kings. The ten horns represent ten kings. We know that because John told us that in Revelation 17, 12. It says the ten horns of the beast are ten kings who have not yet risen to power. They will be appointed to their kingdom for one brief moment to reign with the beast. But Daniel chapter 7 Verse number 8 tells us the Antichrist is going to conquer three of the ten kings. So he's going to have his own little mini kingdom. And the other seven are going to give him their authority with the three that he's conquered. Look at Revelation 17 verses 12 through 13. The ten horns of the beast or ten kings have not yet risen to power. They will be appointed to their kingdoms for one brief moment to reign with the beast. They will all agree to give him their power and authority. So by conquering three of the ten kings... The Antichrist is going to have his own little mini-kingdom, which makes him the eighth head. Heads represent kingdoms. But his mini-kingdom will still be a part of the seventh kingdom. It's part of the original coalition, part of the revived Roman Empire. Does that make sense? So he's in the eighth head, but he's also a part of the seven. So let's look at verse 11 again. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. In other words, he has his own mini kingdom. And is of the seven, still a part of the coalition, and he goeth into perdition. Congratulations. That's it. You now understand the mystery of the beast. 
which means that you belong to an elite group of Christians because a very small minority of people truly understand the mystery of the beast. Now, before we end, we're going to go back to verses 9 and 10 because I told you that I was going to explain verse number 9. Verse number 9 and 10 says, This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kingdoms. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. Now, verses 9 and 10 is what scholars refer to as double symbolism. Because the seven heads represent two different things. We only looked at one thing that they represent. The seven heads represented seven kingdoms. We kind of went off on a tangent there. But we just kind of ignored verse number 9. Did you notice that? This is a double symbolism. Because the seven heads represent two different things. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. The seven heads are also seven kingdoms. Now, the interesting thing about double symbolism is that once you understand the symbolism of one of the two, it explains the other. It's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. You figure out the symbolism of one, then you put all of the pieces together, and when you do that, it all makes sense. How many of you ever put a jigsaw puzzle together, and what do you do? You start with the outside corners. It's like, if I can get all the outside corners together and then get all these colors. Well, whenever you have double symbolism, you have to figure out one of the symbolisms of the two. And when you do that, it begins to fit together. So, let's look at what we know. We know that the woman is a city. We studied that last week. Verse number 18 clearly says that. She sits on seven hills. Now, there is only one ancient city that's known as the city on seven hills. Now, why do we say ancient city? Because there's another city, isn't there? Someone's going to come up and ask me later. I'll tell you. But there's only one ancient city that's known as the city on seven hills. And that's Rome. We also know, because we figured out the symbolism, that the seven heads represent the revived Roman Empire. Remember, five of the heads have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. So the seventh head on the beast represents a future world empire. But because this future empire is going to possess the best characteristics of all of the previous kingdoms, it also has the other six heads. That's why this beast has seven heads and doesn't just have that one head. It also has the previous six. So the seven heads on the beast represent the revived Roman Empire. Now, let's look at what verse number 9 says. It says, this calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. Now, the woman is what? Verse 18, the woman is a city. So, let's just take, can everyone see this? This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads uh, are seven hills on which the woman sits. Let's take out the woman. And let's write in its place, city. Because the woman is a city. And then it goes further. It says this calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the city sits. What are the seven hills on which the city sits? What is that? Rome. The only ancient city that sat on seven hills was Rome. So let's take out the seven hills on which the city sits... And let's just write in here, the seven heads are Rome. Does that make sense? But let's go a little bit further. What do the seven heads represent? Kingdoms, but all seven kingdoms combined, the revived Roman Empire. Because the seventh head is the future empire, but it's made up of All of the best characteristics of the previous six. So when you see the beast with the seven heads, the seven heads represent the revived Roman Empire. So let's take out the seven heads. And let's write in here, revived Roman, how's that, empire. 
So the revived Roman Empire or Rome. That doesn't sound right unless you, go to, unless you live in Cherokee County, right? Now, the reason it's R is because the seven heads was plural. But now we changed it because the seven heads represent the revived Roman Empire, which is singular. So what do we do? We take out R and replace it with the same thing that's singular. The revived Roman Empire is Rome. And Rome is the mysterious name, or I should say, Babylon is the code name for Rome. And so on the seventh vial, when that's poured out and the destruction of Babylon's coming, God is going to wipe out this revived Roman Empire, the empire of the beast. But what he was telling us in chapter 17 when he said, the seven heads are the seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also, and he goes on, seven kingdoms. So what takes place is, once we found that out, that came back and, and just made sense. Now, why would he tell us this? Why is this important? It's because this tells us the capital city of the revived Roman Empire. What will the capital city of the Roman, revived Roman Empire be? Rome, do not mistake the whore of Babylon with the city of Babylon. The whore of Babylon is the Vatican City. The city of Babylon is Rome. Midway in the tribulation, the whore of Babylon will be destroyed because the beast and the ten kings hate her. They now have the power... But Rome is the capital city and it's not destroyed until the end of the tribulation when the seventh vial is poured out, which we're going to get to in chapter 18. Now, about two weeks ago, I had a time of question and answers and someone raised their hand and they said, you know, Jerusalem's going to be the capital city of the beast. And I said, no, no, no. Rome is the capital city of the beast. How did I know that? Revelation chapter 17 Verse number 9. Well, doesn't Jerusalem play an important part? Yes. He will have a palace in Jerusalem. But kings have palaces all over. In fact, if you go to Israel, when we're up on the Mount of Olives, we're also going to go behind a place that's called the, uh, the Seven Arches Hotel. The Seven Arches Hotel actually was, as I've already told you, was the Jordanian palace when the Jordans had control of Jerusalem. But after the war and Israel took over that, then of course they had to move the palace and they converted it into a hotel. But what's kind of interesting about it is he has palaces all over. The beast is going to have a palace in Jerusalem, but the capital city of the revived Roman Empire will be the very same place that it was in John's day. And that's why it's given the mysterious name of Babylon, because they referred to it as Babylon.